We had this gentleman on a few, just a few days ago, and he was predicting, you know, that chaos would break out and all that. And sure enough, less than a week later, the markets are dropping, going up and down. Uh, financial planners are sending out all these notices. Hey, don't worry. Don't panic. The market's going to come back. And sure enough, just like magic, it just bounces back. You know, like, oh, my God, it's like magic. So today we're going to be talking to very dear contributor to our program. His name is Bert Doman, and he's been doing these forecasts, and he's, he's the most accurate guy I know for the past 36 years. And he was the one that sounded the alarm on China a long time ago. You know, this is in 2012. His book came out, The China Crisis. It was earlier than that, I think, right, Bert? Yeah, uh, it was about three years ago. Three years ago. So, anyway, he was sounding the alarm, and nobody paid attention. It was like, you know, it's almost like the boy who cried wolf, and the wolf did show up. So, anyway, uh, he's going to tell us what's going on now, because in my line of work, there's a lot of what I call the old timers who are getting out. You know, they don't want to write advisory letters anymore for one reason: it's corrupt. Markets are manipulated. You can't make an accurate forecast. The government and the banks and whoever else is in charge is interfering with it. So it's a very, very important program for you today, especially if your future is dependent upon the stock market. Also joining us today is Melissa Marler. She's one of the producers of the Rich Dad Radio Show. And she's going to, anytime if Bert and I go too far ahead over people's heads, she's going to step in and say, we don't understand that. So our job is to educate you and also inform you why the worst advice you can give yourself and your child today is go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, buy a house get out of debt, and invest for the long term in a 401k or the stock market. If you're still subscribing to those ideas, this is your program, because we have some very bad news for you. And the man we have on today is always always with us. Like I said, very rarely do we bring somebody on so quick or so soon after their last visit. But it is so timely because everything he is talking about is coming true now. And I can't believe it. You know, people, I was watching C, CBS television, the news with Scott Pelley. He says, gee, I didn't know China was in trouble. And this is just a few weeks, a few days ago. And guys like uh, Bert Doman and another guy, Richard Duncan, who's a contributor to us, they've been warning us about China for years. So, Bert, what's happening? Why is this marketing up and down? Well, uh, people got over leveraged in China. Um uh, you know, the uh, average investor is uh, really a neophyte. Uh, they Are we were, talking about uh, Chinese or Americans? Uh, in China, Chinese. Chinese <laughs> okay. in China. And 31%, it was, uh, 31 of the accounts being opened up were opened up by illiterate people or people who didn't even have a great school education. Uh, over 1 million brokerage accounts a week were being opened up. They went in, uh, in there with highly, uh, you know, highly leveraged. In the U.S., we can use two-to-one leverage that's regulated by the SEC. In China, they had special ways to do it via these um, organizations or trusts. Let's put it that way. The trusts are formed by banks so that people get, could get five-to-one leverage. At five-to-one leverage, that means that if the stock goes down 20%, you have wiped out all of your own money. And uh, this is what has happened. So now we have most investors have lost everything, in including China. their farm in China. And that, of course, will have worldwide repercussions. You have to remember that about 50% of economic growth worldwide was China in the last 15 years. Yes, yes. But Bert, 50%. Bert, Bert, how many years have you been warning us that China was a, almost a Ponzi scheme, almost an illusion? How long have you been telling us that? The last three years. Uh, three years ago, I wrote a book. I thought it was much too early in the early 2000s. I know there were some uh, people talking about it. I said, no, things, things are uh, getting very over leveraged uh, there, but they have so much catching up to do. China was basically in the dark ages uh, 40 years ago, and they had a lot of catching up to do with the Western world. They were getting all of the technology from the Western world, 100 years worth of technology, they were getting free. And uh, so that means that their economy could grow and grow and grow, and they could see these excesses accumulate without it endangering the economy. Right, Three right. years ago, 
I said they have reached the end of the road. Now is when the entrepreneurships should take over in the economic cycle, but it cannot do that in China because it's communistic. So, but also, you were warning a long time ago about six million empty condos, and that's because all these investors were running in who believe that real estate is a great investment, so they just bought all these condos, and they're empty, right? But you were warning of this a long time ago. Well, actually, it was uh, three years ago. They had 64 million condos were empty, and, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but they didn't try to fill them. See, this is what people, they see the number, and they misinterpret that. It, it, people use condominiums like we use a stock to put your investment capital there. As soon as a person lives in those buildings, the value diminishes drastically because the quality of construction is so poor that when somebody lives in there for a year or two, the whole thing starts falling apart. But, 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 but Bert, this is what was happening. That those 64 million condos was the cause of the boom. All these, every third world nation like Australia and all that, not, not Australia's third world, but they were shipping all these raw materials to China to build condos and factories that nobody would ever use, right? Yes. And the much bigger investment, of course, was roads, airports, railroads, etc. And this is very good in the economic development, but the return on investment for the country for that invests its money, its reserves, it, it is, is nothing, basically. You know, everybody, all the bulls on China talk about China having $3.7 trillion in reserves. They said, oh, they have so much money, you know, they can take an economic crisis. No, that money is invested. It's invested in the ground, in roads. They don't have that money, $3.7 trillion, sitting in a bank or underneath their mattresses. That money is gone. So, so now they're starting to sell U.S. treasuries. They're starting to sell assets in order to get cash, in order to fight their currency crisis. So that's a great – so today we're talking to Bert Dome. Like I said, he was on just a few days ago warning us that the stock market was going to come down. The reason we brought him back on – is because when China developed, developed the yuan, the markets all started to crash. Basically, the communist government of China had to admit that they were in trouble. And that's what happened. And all the markets are crashing. Meanwhile, back here in the States, the these financial planners are calling everybody say, hey, don't worry, it's only China. <laughs> America yeah. is sound and all that. Melissa, Melissa is going to uh, you know, be part of this program today. What Any questions on this? Because... And what does it mean to you? When you well, listen? yeah, I, I, I agree. My financial planner, I mean, the advice is always don't don't look at don't open your statements for a while. Just go ahead and throw <laughs> them in the drawer. It's going to come back. Here's the history. So so, Bert, if I could, I just want to go back. When you talk about the the fact that everybody thought that China had the three point seven trillion dollars in reserve. Is is there a false sense that in the U.S.? I mean, do we is something like that exist here? I mean, if if if, if the bottom falls out. Are we going to be okay? Well, you see, we, we really have to go back to, to my book, The Coming Tri China Crisis, uh, three years ago. I said exactly, this is what's going to happen. And I said, most American investors are, don't care about what happens in China. They say, no, I will never invest in China, therefore I don't care. And I always said, it doesn't matter. I would never invest in China either. Right. However, it will infect the global system. I said, when China, the China's crisis surfaces, you're going to see a tsunami. Tsunami throughout the uh, Western financial uh, world, mm -hmm. and it's going to take down every every stock market there is, and that's why you have to care. And it's right. not just it's not just the Western world; it's the third world that supplies raw materials to China. Is that, that correct? It, yes, Robert, that, that is exactly correct. And the people ask me, how do you how do you make money out of a crisis in China? You short Chinese stocks. I said, no, you never want to short the Chinese stocks. Because they're so manipulated. Right now, for example, the only big buyer in China uh, is the government. Everyone else is standing aside because the government has said to all the financial companies, ETFs, mutual funds, uh, brokerage firms, you are not allowed to sell. Okay, well, if you're wait, not allowed wait, wait, one more to sell, time. you're not going to buy. The Chinese government said to the banks of China, investment banks you cannot sell that's right you cannot sell so, and they also said if short selling is prohibited if you sell short we will arrest you so and they also arrested yesterday the managing director of the largest brokerage firm Citic, in china 
the largest firm. The, today the news was that they arrested eight other employees as well. They didn't say why. They probably were selling against the prohibitions against selling. You know, this is what happens in a dictatorship. We have to remember that China is a dictatorship. On top of that, it's a communist dictatorship. How can you have anything worse? Right, right. So, Melissa, what's your question? Well, on this? I have another question. Why, why is the, U, the, the U.S. stock market back up today then? Why? Oh, why? this is sheer manipulation. You know, and, and I've been writing about this for several years. You know, after the 1987 stock market crash, okay, they, uh, they got their, you know, all of the big thinkers and hedge funds got together and so on. And in 1988, President Reagan signed a bill which was called the President's Working Group on the Financial Markets. Very long title. We call it PPT for short. That stands for Plunge Protection Team. They, their office is in the U.S. Treasury in Washington. The, the guys there, are, they have one mission, and that is to preserve orderly markets. Please look it up. If you don't believe me, look it up on Google. Just go, put in there the president's wor- uh, working group on the financial markets, and you will see what their mission is. Once so again. when the market go- go declines too much, their, uh, their job is to go in there, they buy the index futures, and that uh, puts the market up. So that's why the market jumped back, right back up after it went down. Yes. yes. So what you're saying, I mean, let's just say it, it's manipulated. The U.S. stock market is manipulated. Absolutely. Once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. I hope you're paying attention right now for all of you people who believe in, you know, American pie, the apple, I mean, the um, apple pie, the godmother and the fairy princess, you know, that your mark, your money is safe and people are looking out after you. For those of you who really believe that the stock markets are honest and clear and all this stuff and the Fairy Godmother's watching out for your 401k. This is your program for you. So once again, Bert Dolman is a professional trader, investor, and analyst. He's the founder of Dolman Capital Research. He has been giving us analysis and forecasts for traders and investors for over 36 years. He is probably, in my opinion, the most accurate. But the trouble with being accurate, sometimes he's too far in the future for people to see it. So his website is dolmancapital.com. Please go to his website. His letter, which everybody in our company and most of my friends read, is called the Wellington Letter. And on August 17th, 2015, the title said, Be Prepared for the Fall. And he wasn't talking about autumn. (laughs) And Bert's been talking about China for a long time. There was basically an illusion that it was growing by so many, about 25% per year in the full employment all they were doing was building these huge condominium developments, 64, 60 million or 6 million are empty, plus these huge factories that are empty. And that's where all the money was going, was they're hoping for the boom to continue, but it never boomed. And now it's going to go bust. Any comment? And Melissa is our producer, but she's going to be here because sometimes Bert and I get into language and discussions that a lot of people don't understand. So anything you want to say so far, Melissa? Well, I, I just have a quick question because um, this is what you see. The headlines always talk about Apple. I just I just wondered, um, Bert, so can you explain how Apple affects the markets? I mean, that's always one of the big headlines. And I don't know if that's the, the media trying to play to the masses. Or can you just explain in layman's terms, what effect is that? And why should we be watching Apple? Well, uh, Apple is the company, the most valued company in the world. And you don't so like them, do you? Capitalization. You take the number of shares outstanding, multiply it by the stock price, and you get the valuation of the company in the marketplace. But you've been speaking it, out against Apple for a long time also. Uh, yes. At, uh, you know, since the beginning of the year, I said Apple now is, has exhausted everything. They came out with a bigger iPhone. Uh, they had about a two-and-a-half-year uh, lapse in that, the behind the competition. So there were, there were a, lo- a lot of people who were Apple fo- uh, uh, files, basically, and they wanted that bigger phone that other people had had for a long time already if they bought Samsung. So th- there was a lot of pent-up to date. Right now, they have nothing else to come back with. They had the watch, which is a flop, and I wrote an article about that on Forbes. Uh, then they had the Apple Pay, which uh, has about 2.5% of all the payment. Uh, Samsung Pay and uh, Android Pay can be used by most of the terminals that are out there. Apple Pay uh, uh, 
the retailer has to pay several thousand dollars for mm-hmm. the terminals. So basically, Apple now is also being used as a manipulative vehicle by the PPT. It's a, it, if you can manipulate the stock price of Apple, you are manipulating the major indices, and it's easy to do. So uh, I've, I've been writing uh, for the last several months. I said, when Apple finally breaks down, the whole stock market is going to break down. And it finally did, and we put in an article uh, on our website, domancapital.com, and said, you know, why Apple is going to be a very poor investment at best. Let- very poor. And, and this happened. It started breaking down. So anybody who bought Apple in the last six months is sitting there at, at a big loss. There's that's, that's, that's another big point to the, what uh, Melissa's question is. Apple is held by most pen, pension funds, mutual funds, ETF. You know, everybody's holding Apple. So when Apple goes down, you may not, I may not have any shares of Apple. But we're, my retirement might, right? Yes, exactly. So it's, everybody it, has it. You know, when everybody is in something, you don't want to be in there because <laughs> the only thing that can happen then is that they sell. So once again, let's talk more about the plunge protection team. You know why I want, I want you to stay on this? Because most people do not believe our government is corrupt. Most Americans have this stupid idea that Americans wear white hats, you know, like the old cowboy pictures. And they oh, they would never do that to us. When I mentioned the plunge protection team or the president's working uh, party on the financial markets, they look at me like I'm some kind of a uh, whack job. What more can, how, why are they doing this? Why don't they tell us more about this? Yeah, I used to believe in the Easter Bunny, too, when I was uh, a lot younger. Uh, but then I found out the Easter Bunny doesn't exist. No, it, it's, it's unfortunate that people uh, have come to believe this fiction that uh, Washington is benevolent and they do everything for our good. And our, bank, and our banks are on our side. Yeah, and, you know, people, I, I think, have woken up. Uh, right now, the popularity rating of Congress is 7%. 7% trust the government. Uh, so people have gotten a lot smarter. And you can see the popularity of a certain candidate that you know very well. And uh, people have finally gotten fed up with career politicians, and they say, we need somebody in Washington who's, who watches out for the country and for the people, you not think, for their own pocketbook. Do you think that's possible, given the size of this financial crisis? I mean, what could Obama or Trump or Hillary ever say to China to make this global situation better? Nothing, No, right? they created the, you know, every, everything that's in place uh, for the last 20 years or more has created the conditions that we have now. Right. They have created but, this crisis. But it's so big right now, there's no president, I don't care who the candidate is, that could save us right now. Well, save us from what? You know, you can, uh, I, I remember in the late 1970s when we had double-digit inflation, the prime rate was 21%, and people said this is the end of the world. And I said, no, it isn't. You know, we're going to have a big recession. We're going to have a big uh, plunge in the stock markets and in the precious metals. But out of that will come another great profit opportunity. And that's what I expect right now. No, but yes, my, my, you, I understand. But my question, my question is, is there any candidate that's powerful enough to, to – see, this is you know, what they're saying. Oh, don't worry. America's fine. Do you believe that? No, I think it can be fine. No, I, I understand. America, but... th- this is, uh, th- this is the uh, greatest economic power on the world. The people are industrious. The people are honest. You go anywhere in the world, you get screwed every, every time you turn around. You, you hear <laughs> people. I have never seen the generous people like you have in the United States. When somebody needs something, they always give. But Bert, but Bert. You know, I tell you, when we get a, finally a, a good leadership in Washington, you get rid of all the career politicians in the Congress and so on, I would back up the truck and buy every stock in sight. Yeah, but what's the, what's the out of that happening? It may happen. Who knows? 2016. <laughs> well, you're a bigger you're optimist away. than me. <laughs> yes. but you know, all you got to be optimistic. <laughs> okay, so let's let's go back to the, the big picture, right? We were talking about the, uh, bot cri- the Thai bot crisis, and yes. then we we're talking about the Russian crisis, the long-term capital management. Yeah. Very quickly, can you explain what happened with the Thai bot crisis back in 97, I think it was, right? Yes, there were two crises uh, in the consecutive years, the Thai crisis, Thailand, and then the Russian crisis. Russia defaulted on its debt, and Thailand uh, defaulted on its debt. Both, you know, both countries are not that significant in the world. Thailand definitely is not, and uh, but they caused... Uh, uh, just tremendous crashes in the in all of the stock markets in the world, 
uh, many of the uh, uh, Thai stocks and the Asian stocks were down 80, 90 percent in just a month's time. And uh, so th- th- this, these were small countries. Russia may be a big country geographically, uh, if you count the number of acres, uh, but, you know, it can, the economic power at that time was not very big. So these caused worldwide crises. And now you've got a country like China, which is 50 percent of the growth of the world economies in the last 15 years came from China, and that country is now in crisis. How can anybody say that this is not going to infect the entire globe? This is going to be very painful. And the next pain is going to come from the emerging markets. The emerging markets are now in such a terrible situation because their currencies have plunged 20 to 30 percent in just a month's time. And, and much of their debt is measured in U.S. dollars. Exactly. They have borrowed U.S. dollars because they were cheap, low interest rates, and they said, oh, that's fine, we, but they have to repay them in so, dollars. So we now, might... if they convert their cheap money into dollars, they have to use 30% more, and they don't have it. Once again, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. We're talking today to one of our more popular guests, Bert Dolman. Once again, he was brought back early because he warned us. He said on August 17th, he said, prepare for for the fall. And now it's fallen, so we're just now bringing you up to date. So we brought him right back. I'm in the studio with Melissa Marlowe, who is our producer here. And we want to have people aware of what's going on globally. Every time, you know, Bert, every time I hear those guys on CNBC say, don't worry, don't worry, the U.S. stock market is fine, your pensions are fine, you know, America is strong, we're growing. We don't live in a vacuum anymore, do we, as the United States? I mean, we're not just the United States. Everybody, you know, like, I always say Apple isn't even an American company. It's headquartered here, but it's all over the world. Exactly. You know, uh, you never want to believe these guys that, uh, that come on TV. In fact, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking here the last two weeks, I said, you know, this, uh, watching this uh, financial TV is dangerous for your financial health. <laughs> uh, uh, well, no, really, for the average person who doesn't, who cannot identify between what they hear and what is real, you know, it's very dangerous. But I remember, in, uh, you know, this is so reminiscent of 2008 before the real crisis hit later that year. I wrote a book in 2007, Prelude to Meltdown was the title. And it was about the 2008 crisis that I'd expect. I said, this is going to be a 1929 event. Nobody wanted to believe that. Nobody wanted to believe it. And then in 2008, financial TV, I even wrote two producers that said, don't be so bullish all the time. Your viewers are going to go over the cliff at least, you know, have some comments on there that the markets are not as good as you may think. So, totally ignored. So, you know, I, I wrote my book in 2002 predicting the biggest stock market in history coming in 2016, but I also predicted there would be an intermediate crash coming around 2007. So, so far, our, our timing is accurate. You know, Bert was God because his his forecasts are so accurate. A lot of people didn't like his forecasts. I mean, they should have listened to you so they get upset with you. But anyway, he's been doing it for over 36 years. He now lives in Los Angeles. His website is domancapital.com. He's the author of Prelude to the Meltdown, which warned of the 2007-2008 crisis. And he has been warning us about the China crisis for years now, but I never understood why until I read another friend's book. You know, it's Richard Duncan, who lives in Thailand, and Richard has worked for the IMF and the World Bank. He's he's also a part of our program. And he said the only reason the Chinese economy was booming was because they were building, you know, condos that nobody would ever live in, and they were building factories that nobody would ever work in. So all the concrete and steel and all that that was going to China, that made, you know, the third world countries that supplied raw materials to China rich. So everybody thought China was going to go on forever, and Bert's been warning us it's an illusion. It's an illusion. So just a few days ago, the Chinese devalued the yuan, and people don't worry about it. It doesn't affect us. Well, if the yuan goes down, that means life gets more you know, life gets tougher in America. Our also, also our guest is Melissa Marler. And she's a producer, and she'll ask any question for the regular person out there who needs to understand. So let me. I'm, I'm going to say what what can the average person do? And I'm going to say the first. There's a there's a 
thing in physics that says two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. In other words, if you have a one-car garage, you can't put two cars in it. So the reason most people are in trouble, they still have the old industrial age financials survival theme, which is go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, invest for the long term in the stock market, get out of debt and all this stuff. So let's start with go to school. You know, the same time China was coming down a few days ago, the Wall Street Journal runs this article that 6.9 students are now in default on their student loans. That means if they declare bankruptcy, their credit rating is destroyed before they even get a job. So, Bert, what would you say to people who say you should go to school? I mean, what can you do to do something different? You know, uh, you've probably noticed, Robert, that over the last uh, several years, uh, we have read more and more articles in the national media about, you know, is a college education worth the cost? And my answer to that is no. I put my three kids through a very expensive un- uh, university, and I don't think it was worth it. I think they can learn much more with reading books, going online. Online education is so much better because you can choose what you want, what you think you need. You don't have to study all of this superfluous stuff, psychology, philosophy, how to be politically correct, uh, you know, special ethnic studies, etc. You right. know, they're, they're wasting so much time. But your college. kids, your kids Spend had, your time on importance. Right. Your kids had a huge advantage because I met them. They're great kids. They have you as a dad. You see, it's, a, you. it's the same as me as I had my rich dad teaching me. Yeah. You know, my poor dad was saying the same thing about go to school and get a job, which makes you an employee. And my rich exactly. dad was saying go to school and become an entrepreneur. Exactly. Know, and that's what you're saying. Take control of your money. Next question is this. When somebody says I'm saving money, you know, I mean, my point of view is why would you save money when everybody's printing it? What do you have to say? Yeah, I agree. You know, the money is uh, really just confetti. I always call it confetti. And uh, the only reason it has any value is because we need to buy things. And a grocery store doesn't accept anything else except currency or plastic. The plastic is going to uh, become the, ru- the rule of the land and the law of the land. I think uh, longer term, uh, currency will be outlawed. Uh, because they want to tax the underground economy, which is probably 30 to 40 percent of the economic activity right now. So we're going to go over to a digital uh, system, which means that, of course, when your credit cards are shut off because you have the wrong political philosophy, uh, <laughs> then you, go, you get very hungry unless you're a good hunter. Well, well, let me ask you this. What would you say to somebody right now who, like I said, you cannot put two cars in a one-car garage? So well, I didn't they're, know they're, you were a physicist, but that's very good. <laughs> but, they're, but they're sitting there, you know, saving money, saving money, saving money. How much money is the world economy printing right now? Uh, they're printing huge amounts. The, uh, the Federal Reserve printed about four and a half uh, a trillion dollars. Uh, all the central banks together in the last several years printed over thirteen trillion dollars. To compare that, the, uh, the size of the U.S. economy is about eighteen trillion dollars. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's a lot of money that they've printed out of thin air. They used to have to actually print currency notes. You know, and I remember going through the uh, Bureau of Engraving where they make our money, and uh, they, they were so proud. They had just gotten the, uh, the uh, new printing presses, and the person showing us there, he said, yes, we have the fastest printing presses in the world, Heidelberg presses from Germany. And, you know, everybody remembers the German hyperinflation in the early 1920s. <laughs> You know, so but now they don't need those printing presses. They just do it with a computer. It's called cyber money. Right. So what would you say to that person sitting there right now with, you know, he's trying to get a new car in the garage, but he's, but he's already got the, i got to save money. What would, you, what would you say to them? What can they do? What can they do for, for what? In regard to investments? Rather than saving money. Yes. You know, you, you want to save because people have debt. That's the one thing everyone has. And what, no, but, but, what but, do Bert, most people Bert, not Bert, have is Bert, money. Would you, would you use, look, would you use savings as a long-term uh, plan? No. Not, that's not what, I'm, tra- that's what I'm trying to get at. No. The, be- the best place to put your money at first is 
Get educated about what's happening. Read, read, read. This is how you, 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 you fight the, your emotions to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. I know people right now, they're bargain hunting. We were at a, a, a two weeks ago, we were at a, a social event. There was a, an elderly couple we know very well, very nice people. He's got a 401k, and he said, what should I do with the 401k? And, but he didn't know uh, what he had in it. In fact, I've asked for the last 15 years, I've asked uh, probably, you know, 500 people or more, do you know what's in your 401k? And no one knows. I haven't met one person who knows what's in their 401k. And I told him, if you do one thing tomorrow morning, get all of your money and whatever it's in right now and put it into treasury bills, short-term treasury bills, right, because but, the next several months are going to be very tumultuous in the market. And I, I understand that, but you know what I'm saying is they're so used to taking advice, and how do they know if your advice is good for them or not? That's they what don't. I'm getting at. So the other, But I want to get back to one more thing. I want to recommend people read the Wellington letter. You know, you've been talking about reading, and Bert's not paying me a commission for this, but I would go to domancapital.com. I was first thing I would subscribe to is the Wellington letter. How much does that cost? I'm, I'm mis, mis, uh, misquoted it's the price. It's forty nine dollars a month right now, which is the greatest bargain. The price is going to go up very very soon uh, because it's been that uh, that same price over yeah. ten years. So I'm just trying to say, please start with Bert's letter. It's it's not necessarily easy, but it's clear, it's simple, and he explains. And he's the guy that's been warning us for years. So if you really want to get ahead of the game, the thing I love about the Wellington letter, it's up to date, moment to moment. You've got to change your format because it's changing, the economy is changing so fast, right? You know, Robert, yes, we, uh, it used to be a monthly. Now we put out three to four issues a month, even Sunday night uh, before the Monday crash this week. Sunday night, we put out an issue. Sunday night at 9 o'clock, we were sitting there putting out an issue of the Wellington letter. Uh, now, that is uh, a service beyond what anybody expects, and we always try to deliver more than ex- is expected. Right. So once again, we're talking to Bert Doman. He is the professional. He's a professional trader. He's more than that. The guy is a futurist. He is the pulse on the market. He sees it coming before it happens. He's been warning us about China for a long time. And now you stay warned. We also have Melissa Marlin who will step in in case Bert and I say things that are not understandable. But we really want you to understand something, that most people are in trouble because they're sitting with old ideas in their head. If you're saving, like, you know, Bert, we're from Hawaii, right? And most Asians have tons of cash. But every time I show them the chart of the purchasing power of the dollar, they can't believe it because they really believe that cash is, is the best. And I said, look, every time you print money, the value, the purchasing power of your dollar goes down. And it's really hard for them to understand because their mommy and daddy told them to save money. This is the last question you brought it up. What would you say to somebody who believes, and you already mentioned, if I have a 401k, I'm safe. What would, what do you, what would you say to them? Well, I, I would first say, be sure you know what's in there. People don't even know if they have mutual funds, if they have ETS, if they have stocks, if they have bonds. You have to know what's in there so that you can make some intelligent decisions. You know, I, I'd like to say something. I, I remember I read your first book, on, uh, and you talked about real estate and positive cash flow. And I thought that was so intelligent because you proposed something that I had said for a long time. I said, you have to know what it is. Real estate, in many instances, is a liability and not an asset. Right. You know, so you want real estate with a positive cash flow, and you know the definition of positive cash flow. You know, it's happiness. <laughs> you know, and amen, uh, brother. <laughs> exactly, and you it's know, a religion what's, for me. What's, what's good about real estate is that you don't get your emotions involved. When a stock drops thirty percent or forty percent in a day or a half a day, uh, you check it out at the bottom. And I see that happening all the time. Do you know on Monday this week, during the 1,086-point crash, you know, the night before, we had said the China market is crashing. And I said on Friday in our trading services, I said, watch the China market Sunday night. If China crashes, that means that the government is, uh, has, uh, cannot control the market anymore. And that means the world is going to crash on Monday. And, and I said, 
the equivalent decline in the Dow would be 1,300 points. What a decline 1,100 points on my, my God, day, intraday. You're, you're, you know? you're losing your touch there, 200 points. <laughs> yeah, 200 points. You know, yeah, but, the po- but really, th- this is what is – but real estate is a great investment if you have positive cash flow. If you know how to do it, that's the thing. Yes. Well, this is yes. the point right here, okay? I invest in real estate because I don't have the same brain that Bert does. I've, t- I've taken those courses, you know, options trading, stock trading, stochastic moving averages. My brain doesn't fit that. I have a slow brain. My brain likes real estate. Markets go up, markets go down. The cash keeps flowing in. Now, Bert, when the markets are going up and down, he's in hog's heaven, and he's making a lot of money. Then you look at what's inside your 401k. At that point, you'd better decide whether you're going to be a fundamental investor. I'm kind of fundamental. I just want money coming in and less money going out, whereas Bert is technical, which means he's going with the ups and downs of the market. Is that very pretty simply said? Yes. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I would like to say something uh, because so many people have asked me over the years, what can, what can you help me with in my investments? So we developed a program last year, and I don't want this to sound like a promotion, but we call it Hedgefolios. Go to our website, hedgefolios.com. Uh, there are five portfolios. You can replicate our model portfolio. If you look at it, what it is. If you like it, you just click, and your portfolio is lined up with ours. It's that easy. So please, uh, but, let's but, You know, no, no, let me just say, here in the last, from beginning of July, to, uh, I think it was yesterday, we did the calculation. The portfolios were up from 6% to 9% in those seven weeks. While the stock markets of the world were plunging, we were up instead of down. So that shows you something. And if you choose any financial advisor, always ask, how did you do in 2008 during the crisis year? If they lost money during that year, I think you should continue looking somewhere else. (laughs) So, Melissa, final question for Bert here. Um, well, I, I would I would just ask, you know, and, and you guys have been talking, we talk about the 401k. It's back to school time. That's most people are, that's all they're dealing with right now. They're just in survival mode. I got to get my kids in school. I got to get to soccer practice, Bert. You know, I know it's falling, but what what can I do today? You know, couples are fighting. You know, I'm talking to my own friends and they're like, listen, we had an argument last night. I told my husband, we got to get out of the market tomorrow. And he says, no, we can't afford to take the hit. I tell him we can't afford to stay in. What's the answer? The answer is that you you get a source of continuing advice, the best right. advice that you can get, advice that has been good over the years. We have caught every important market decline over 38 years. Now, that is a track record, okay? And that's what you want. You don't want to listen and, and act on just what you hear on TV, what you read in the, uh, in, a, in a newspaper, and or, you know, something that's just well, one Bert, time. Bert, Bert, because Bert. you need the follow-up. Bert, let me ask you this. How many financial planners can do what you do? Well, you know, like anything. Well, uh, how, how many, many How many doctors are really good? Maybe 10%? <laughs> how many brain oh, surgeons God, are really you're, you're good? Oh, God, you're generous. You're generous. <laughs> you're generous. Most financial planners have no idea what you're talking about. And that's why I really want – we've got to run. But I really thank you for being on this program. Right. I hope I hope everybody has been disturbed enough to say, maybe I better take control of my own money rather than just leave it up to somebody I don't even know. So, Bert, Absolutely. thank you very much for your – always your brilliant insight, keeping it simple, and your contribution to all of us. So if you want to hear this program again, go to richdadradio.com. And once again, I want to thank – Bert Dolman, he's a professional trader, been a friend for years. His web- website is dolmancapital.com. Look, you've really got to. This is my, I hate to give, shake my finger at people, but if you don't take control of what you put in your head, then somebody will put garbage in there. And like I was saying, you can't put two cars in a single car garage. And most people can't get out of their way because they still think saving money is smart. They still want to invest for the long term. And they think their financial uh, advisor is really an expert. They're salespeople. They don't eat unless they sell you something. And if you lose money, they still eat. And you might not. And you can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. And so let's get right into it. Melissa, what's the first question for Ask Robert? Our first question today comes from Callan in Fort Bragg. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. 
says, I'm 18 and just finished your book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's a great book that really opened up my mind, but I'm confused about the friendship part. You say birds of a feather flock together. So how do I start finding rich people to learn from? Everyone I know is in the rat race. Right. And that's a good, very good question. And that's why the story of Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a very pertinent uh, book. You know, lesson number one in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, most people miss it. Lesson one, chapter one, the rich don't work for money. The people in the rat race are working for a paycheck. They're script. They'll never get out of that until they change their mindset. The other thing I, uh, Bert says, you've really got to read different things. So I'm constantly reading. I would start with Bert's letter, subscribe to it. It may give you a, a sense of the future, but you got to put financial words into your head and not the garbage they have around you. So you start by changing you. If you change you, you can change your friends, and you change you by putting different words inside your head. If you're if if you're reading, you know, if you're watching soap operas and all that and the Jerry Springer show, you're, you're probably going to be just like those people on the Jerry Springer show. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Emmanuel in New York. Favorite book, Unfair Advantage. What differs a small business owner from a big business owner? Their mindset. You know, and the IRS determined, says that it's 500 employees, you're big, and you're less than 500, you're small. But most of it is just mindset, and most most minds, most people are small because they're hands-on people. They're called craftspeople, you know, the people who fix your shoes and come in and fix your your plumbing and stuff like that. They work with their hands or they work for the, with their minds. They do it themselves. Whereas I I can't I don't do anything, so I have to have other people do things for me. So it's really a mindset and a skill set. It's very, very different. Good question, though. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Crystal in Los Angeles. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What are your thoughts about the possibility of a bail-in, not bail-out, happening in the U.S. and the potential coming crash, as you predicted, in or around 2016? The first thing I would suggest you do is either read my book, Second Chance, which came out this year, but also I have, a, I have a video called The Man Who Can See the Future. And in there, you'll pick up some financial terms and conditions and the pictures most of them so you can understand why the economy is going the way it is. But the question on a bail-in is this. A bailout is when, they, when the government gives the bank money. A bail-in is when the bank takes your money. So if they have $10 million in savings, the bank just takes your money and pays their bills with your money, your savings. The odds of the United States doing that are very slim because we have one big thing small countries don't have is we can print money. The reason Greece is in so much trouble is they can't print money. U.S. is no different than Greece. We're bankrupt. You know, we're, we can print money or borrow money to pay the interest on our debt. Greece cannot. So if a small country or a small bank has no money, the bank won't bail them out then they'll take the savers' money and pay their bills with it. That's a bail-in. Next question. Our next question comes from Rose in California, favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She says, we rolled our retirement funds into self-directed Roth IRAs a couple of years ago and converted our holdings into silver American Eagle coins. Are the experts suggesting we are still at risk? If so, we'd rather take the 10% penalty than a possible hit or a 100,000% loss. I would take Bert's advice. You've already taken bad advice of putting it into a Roth IRA, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. You can only do what you're capable of doing. For example, I use debt constantly and probably half a billion dollars in debt, but I practice doing that. I'm good at it. If you're not good at using debt, don't do it. So you're probably for your level of education and experience, you're probably doing the right thing. But as Bert said, if you want to change what you're doing, you better change what you're reading and don't do anything with your Roth IRA right now until you know what you're going to do next. Next question. Our next question comes from Griselda in Arkansas. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She says basically this, help, how do I start over after a bankruptcy? Well, bankruptcy, you got to know the differences. We have a program on this. You know, when Trump says he declared bankruptcy, that's corporate bankruptcy. That's good. He, you know, he said it on television. It's a tactic. It's a strategy. It's a way of protecting your real wealth. And then there's personal bankruptcy. Unfortunately, without financial education, most people file personal bankruptcy. You know, I've heard read the story where this one person was $2,000 in debt in a credit card and declared personal bankruptcy. That goes on your record for seven years. 
we were talking about should you go to school because of student loan debt you know six seven million people young kids are coming out of school with bankruptcy on their minds that's personal that means for seven years they're hosed so that's why financial education is crucial that's why I thank you listening listening to the rich dad radio show you can pick these things up but unfortunately if you're in personal bankruptcy it's, it's very it's I would say it's very serious and I would talk to an attorney to get professional legal advice. So what's the last question, Melissa? Our final question comes from George in Miami, Florida. It says, how do T-bills and treasury bonds work? Once again, that's what I would subscribe to Bert because that's his expertise. Look, understand there's debt and equity. So when you have a T-bill or a T-bond, that's technically debt, but it's your equity. In other words, you're putting your equity into debt and somebody is going to pay you the interest for for the use of your equity. Bert recommends that. As I said, he and I are on opposite sides of these things. I would rather be a debtor than a saver. Bert would rather be a saver than a debtor. So I stay completely away of T-bonds and T-bills because I'd rather go and borrow you know, T-bonds and T-bills rather than save equity into them. So there's savings and there's debt. And I love debt. And that's why I'm in real estate. I love cash flow because every month the cash comes flowing in, market goes up, market goes down, and I smile all day long. But the people in the stock market, you know, what goes up must come down. And that's the theme of our show. So you got to know the difference between cash flow and capital gains. When going up and down is capital gains, cash flow is just pure heaven. So you can submit your questions to ask Robert at richdadradio.com.